case involved a series of women who were being murdered and left lying face down in a residential neighborhood. We knew the cases were related because the killer left a message on the third victim's back. So we knew we had a serial killer on our hands. In the early morning hours, on a residential street in Miami, Florida, a paperboy approaches a house and makes a shocking discovery. A dead woman's body on the front lawn. It's the first time something like this has happened in this quiet neighborhood. But it won't be the last. Miami, Florida. Tourists love it for its sandy beaches and its electric nightlife. And thousands of people travel to Miami Beach via the Tamiami Trail, a long road that stretches from Miami to Tampa, Florida. But one year, the well-traveled Tamiami Trail becomes a place of nightmares for Miami-Dade detective Felix Jimenez when a dead body shows up on someone's front lawn. There was no visible trauma to the victim. Uh, at autopsy, it was listed it as an unclassified death. As you can tell, it's a, it's a nice uh, residential neighborhood, uh, a, a suburb of Miami, and uh, clearly not, not some place where you would uh, expect to find uh, a body being done. The victim is soon identified as Lazaro Comesana, one of many prostitutes who do business on the seedier side of the Tamiami Trail. An autopsy reveals that Comesana was strangled. Then, three weeks later, another body is found, once again dumped on the grass in a safe, quiet neighborhood. This is the exact location where the second victim, uh, Daphne Martinez, was found. Luckily for this case, it was the same investigative team that handled the Comesana death that investigated this death as well. And at that time, they began thinking, are these cases related? There are some similarities, but we weren't sure. One month later, they are sure. A third woman, Charity Nava, is found dead near the Tamiami Trail, strangled and left by the side of the road. There are no signs of a struggle. But this time, the killer leaves a message on the body of the victim. In black magic marker, it reads, third. See if you can catch me. We have never seen something like that before. Rarely do you have a message like that uh, from a killer, uh, as far as that, uh, that obvious of a message. The note left on the third victim's back seems clear enough. The killer won't stop unless someone else stops him. It told us that this person was very brazen, uh, was beginning to get more and more confident. Uh, we expected him to continue. In a deadly game of cat and mouse, former chief of criminal investigations, John Farrell, decides to take the case to the media, hoping that widespread exposure will yield clues in the case before the killer strikes again. Within three, three and a half months, uh, we had generated uh, through the investigation and the attended publicity uh, about 5,000 leads. We had to, uh, to really think about how to narrow the, the scope and the focus so that we get more of a business-like approach to the investigation. Investigators decide to consult with several criminal profilers across the country. One of those is Special Agent Dale Hinman. Trained at the elite FBI profiling unit in Quantico, Virginia, Agent Hinman has worked on hundreds of cases. She knows that each crime scene tells a story. It's her job to help write the ending. Well, certainly the more cases that you have, the more behavior you have an opportunity to observe. So it's 
for profilers and detectives working a serial case, there's an urgency of trying to prevent the next homicide, but also examining how the person has changed from the first to the second to the third to any subsequent homicides. What is he doing different? One difference catches Special Agent Hinman's eye immediately. The killer's taunting message scrawled on the third victim's back. He wanted to be given credit. He wanted to challenge the police. He wanted everybody to know that he had killed all three of these women. A lot of times people kill victims and they hide the bodies so no one ever knows that they're dead. This individual wanted the victims found and he wanted the police and the media to know that he had killed all three. Three people dead, all at the hands of a serial killer now known as the Tamiami Strangler. On the third victim, the killer leaves a message challenging police to catch him. Now a team of detectives is trying to do just that, but the clock is ticking. It's very different when you're working a series of cases because you absolutely know that any minute you're going to have a next victim. And they do. Only five days after the third victim is found, another body turns up. Wanda Crawford is found in the same residential area near the Tamiami Trail. She has been asphyxiated and left in a parking lot outside of an apartment complex. This time, no note has been left at the scene. But to Special Agent Hinman, there's no doubt that the Tamiami Strangler has struck for a fourth time. Hinman decides to visit the crime scene so she can see what the killer saw. My first impression about this crime scene is that in the first three homicides, the, the scenes look pretty similar. It's all residential neighborhoods that are largely Hispanic. So the offender in this case probably feels this is a comfort zone and he's likely to be Hispanic himself. In order to gather more information, Hinman meets with the lead detective, Felix Jimenez. When you see victims like this where there's no visible trauma, it's basically a soft kill. And the individual who would commit this type of crime would be somebody who was very controlled about what they do. I wouldn't expect to see a criminal history for bar fights or um, just violent acts against strangers. It's the kind of person who walks around with a lot of bottled up anxiety and anger that he's able to be so controlled that he can murder someone and not basically put a scratch on him. One thing that uh, is really interesting, Dale, is how we've noticed that the bodies have been uh, dressed. And one of the ways we can tell is that some of them are, their, their clothing is inside out. And I think that's really important because when this person is completely finished with these victims, he takes the time to dress them neatly and he puts them fully clothed on the side of the road so that whoever finds them, even though they're finding a dead body, they're not being shocked by a naked person lying there in some... Um, degrading position. But, but he's making an impact statement dumping a body in uh, a residential neighborhood exactly. in the front yard, but yet he cares enough to, to dress them and not leave well, them naked. He needs to make more of an impact. Oh, certainly, but he softens the entire issue that this isn't a person who is involved in this rage against women where he's totally out of control. With the information gathered from the meeting, Agent Hinman believes that the killer is likely to be an Hispanic male who lives in the area, someone who craves attention. But because he kills while barely leaving a scratch on his victims, he probably doesn't have a history of violent behavior. Then, less than a month later, a fifth body turns up. Detectives notice that the killer's M.O. is starting to change. Nicole Schneider, our fifth victim, uh, again was from that area she was found in a trailer park well as I mentioned before the first two victims the the level of violence was so minimal that the medical examiner at first was unable to determine the manner of death uh, but progressively uh, we began to notice more and more trauma on all the victims the violence seems to be escalating and so is the pressure on investigators to catch the killer these high media intensive focus full speed ahead investigations uh, public clamor individuals being murdered taunting of police uh, 
it's very difficult not to personalize uh, this and the investigators want it solved so badly uh, they can see the next victim uh, coming out there and there's just uh, this tremendous pressure from all concerned in a race against time detectives fan out across Miami requesting DNA samples from men who frequent the red light district men who live near the Tamiami trail and men with prior convictions for sex crimes thousands of tests are conducted without a single match frustrated detectives must keep moving forward hoping that sooner or later a promising lead will appear and it does a citizen who was walking through a parking lot near the Tamiami Trail found a pile of photographs, a Polaroid type, that depicted an individual writing on a woman's body with a magic marker, and he handed them over to the police. Investigators immediately think of the Tamiami Strangler's third victim and the taunting message that was left on her back by the killer. The man in the Polaroid is quickly identified as Eddie Rowe, an alleged drug dealer who lives right off the Tamiami Trail. We're about five blocks north of the main pickup area where the majority of the victims were picked up by the suspect. Uh, this was Eddie Rowe's house. Uh, the girl in the photograph is Kim Mio, also known as Kim Scott, and clearly visible is uh, the individual Rowe riding on uh, Kim's stomach with a magic marker. With hopes high, investigators take a closer look at Eddie Rowe. This was the guy. I mean, we said, you know, it can't be a coincidence. This, uh, this ties in to, to the case. We have a victim that's been written on with a magic marker, and here's an individual that is writing on someone with a magic marker. And she appears to be uh, uh, passed out or, or dead. Next, on Body of Evidence, has the hunt for the Tamiami Strangler come to an end? A serial killer known as the Tamiami Strangler is stalking his victims, strangling them, then leaving their bodies on the side of the road in a residential area. Investigators are now focused in on a suspect, an alleged drug dealer named Eddie Rowe. This was an important link in the investigation. One of the victims had a message written on her back. A number of the victims either had ties to Eddie Rowe or had been to Eddie Rowe's house. So this was an important direction for the detectives to go in. But that lead begins to crumble when detectives find out that Rowe was in jail at the time of the murders. Just to make sure, investigators ask him for a DNA sample. One week later, the results are in. No match. We had individuals that we swore this was our killer, uh, and uh, the DNA came back negative. But it wasn't that much of a disappointment because we still had so many other viable leads to continue on. Detective Jimenez and his team have started working on other leads when the Tamiami Strangler strikes for the sixth time. A woman named Rhonda Dunn is found strangled and left behind in the same neighborhood as the five previous victims. But this time, the victim has been severely beaten. Some investigators think the killer is simply becoming more violent. But Agent Hinman sees another possibility. Most people would expect that once a person starts killing that there is an escalation in the violence. That really actually didn't happen in this case. You have to consider the victim's reaction to the idea that the person has grabbed them. And if a person is somehow for a split second warned, then they may resist and, and cause injury as a result of fighting with the offender. Agent Hinman suspects that they'll have to wait for the next murder to know if the increased violence is an aberration or not. But even she isn't prepared for what happens next. Absolutely nothing. For the next five months, no new bodies are found and no new suspects emerge. There's not a sound from the Tamiami Strangler. And for Dale Hinman, that silence speaks louder than words. 
This could have meant any one of a number of things, the increased law enforcement presence, or it could have been that he had moved to a different area. So we were all really looking around the state and looking around the nation for similar types of crimes that may occur in a different jurisdiction. We didn't think for a second that these were going to be the last crimes he would ever commit. It was just a matter of time before he surfaced again, or either in that area or somewhere else. Agent Hinman is right on target. Five months after the Tamiami Strangler struck last, police are dispatched to an apartment complex near the Tamiami Trail, where a woman is screaming hysterically. She said that uh, she had been picked up by an individual who lived at this, uh, at this home, had been brought home, at which point uh, uh, she was uh, tied up, beaten, and uh, left there. Was the Tamiami Strangler back in business? Or was this just an isolated incident? There wasn't an immediate connection between the Tamiami Strangler and the current case, but when the crime scene investigator got there and had a look around, he noticed that there were certain similarities that were important. This victim was from the same area as the other victims, and she was bound, which would lead you to believe that the reason she was bound is the person was going to come back, and there was a possibility that she would also be killed. The owner of the apartment unit where the woman is found turns out to be a man named Rory Conde, an unassuming father of two who works at a building supply store in the neighborhood. He's not exactly the type to fit the public's image of a serial killer, and that's exactly why he stands out to Agent Hinman. This individual has to look very ordinary to everyone, a real guy next door kind of look. Not somebody that the media normally portrays as, you know, the evil serial murderer type person who everybody's afraid of. He needs to look very unsuspicious to a very cautious group of women. Coming up, is Rory Conde the Tamiami Strangler? Or have investigators hit another dead end? After an eight-month investigation into a string of murders in Miami, Florida, a prime suspect has emerged, a man named Rory Conde. At his apartment, a woman is found tied with duct tape screaming for help. Could Rory Conde be the Tamiami Strangler? There were some similarities between this victims and the other victims of the Tamiami Strangler. She knew some of the victims and she lived and worked in the same area as they did. Rory Condi was the kind of person who the profilers thought would be responsible for this type of crime. He was nondescript and unassuming. A DNA sample taken from Rory Conde is rushed to the lab while investigators anxiously await the results. I was at a violent crime conference in Fort Lauderdale when Felix paged me and asked me to call him 911. So I stepped away from the table and called, and he told me that he had Rory Conde. Conde's DNA matches the Tamiami Stranglers. And when he is brought in for questioning, Conde surprises investigators by confessing in detail to all six murders. He would pick them up, he would take them, offer them money, he would take them to his home. They willingly responded to his home, at which point he would kill them, uh, redress them, wait till it, the early morning hours uh, of darkness, and place them in the car, and then would take them and dump them in residential neighborhoods near his home. With a DNA match and a confession, the case is handed over to prosecutor Abe Lazor who is struck by Conde's unassuming nature. He's not the guy with three teeth and the big tattoos who you would, you know, steer away from at a bar under every circumstance. He's very pleasant. He's, he's almost nondescript. Um, you know, you go through his high school yearbook or whatever it is, I'm sure that there aren't going to be five people who remember who he is. Conde even offered investigators an explanation for why he committed the murders. It was sort of circular reasoning. His basic concept was this. His wife would catch him coming home late in the morning or, or well past midnight, and she would accuse him of going out to see prostitutes, and eventually he said that he did. So she picked up, took the children, and went back to her parents' home. That made him very angry, and he was going to get back at the prostitutes for ruining his life. 
I didn't say it was a good explanation. I said it was his explanation. Conde also revealed the answer to a question that had plagued Agent Hinman during the investigation. Why did the killer stop killing for a five-month period? We later learned that during that five months where there weren't any crimes that matched these in that area, there was a reconciliation between he and his wife. And he was at that time, you know, trying to stay home and do things to stay involved with his marriage and his, and his two children. We, the jury, find as follows as to the defendant in this case, A, the defendant is guilty of first degree murder. In the end, Rory Conde is tried and found guilty for the murder of his sixth victim and is sentenced to die for the crime. Shortly thereafter, Conde agrees to plead guilty to the five other murders. He remains on Florida's death row. I saw this individual as someone who enjoyed these crimes and wanted attention for the commission of these crimes. Rory Condi may have thought that these women were disposable, but they were not. These were, in many cases, somebody's sister, somebody's daughter, somebody's mother. These are not disposable people. Everybody is a human being and they deserve law enforcement's complete attention and they got it in this case.